The house had a round metal picnic table in the backyard behind the kitchen. The kind with the yellow umbrella that cranks open with a handle. Real cucumber sandwich and tea party affair. And very prim. The backyard also had beetles, bees, lizards scuttling between hot stones and a, a fine view over a canyon with jackrabbits and rattlesnakes. Once a coyote even trotted by so close I could have fed him with a spoon through the chain link fence very wild. So, both prim and wild. The backyard was a good place where I could sit and have a bowl of oatmeal with blueberries, a cup of my own cocoa too. I took to eating my meals out there and that was as good as could be except for the wasps. If I brought chicken or fish out there in two minutes, I'd have 10 wasps swarming my plate in my face so that I'd have to grab my food and run it back inside. Now this weighed on me because my birthday was two weeks off and I wanted to have the kids, wh whom you've heard from this evening, <laughs> <laughs> and their people over for a, a real Vulcanalia, a big bonfire party like the Romans would do in August to appease Vulcan, the god of fire. I had read about this festival and I, I like to imagine the Romans celebrating in say the year 80. Back then, they would be taking this festival extra seriously, trying to appease a deity that had just buried Pompeii so hard, the ash had smothered the lovers side by side, right in their beds. In the year 80, the Vulcanalia would have felt to Romans like a, a last bash, a feast of light to show an angry god that, hey, look, look at this party. Life is sweet. <laughs> So please, you know, not again, please, <laughs> let us be okay. And that's kind of how this birthday felt for me. My world felt unstable, like Vesuvius, with two grown kids near the end of undergrad, perhaps soon headed off to some new adventure, and me having missed so many good years with my head too much buried in work. What's more, I had recently blown up my old life separated from their mother during the pandemic, uprooting myself to the city of San Diego to find some new way of living. And in light of these tectonic shifts, a backyard Vulcanalia bonfire felt right. So time to prepare was running out and no wasps were on my guest list. I ordered a wasp trap a see-through orange plastic job about the size of a cantaloupe. It was the, <laughs> the kind of trap that wasps can figure out how to get into, but not get out of. That trap worked so well that in two days I had 40 wasps to knock into a garbage bin. I pictured the queen wasp haranguing her secretary, like, hey, didn't we used to have more wasps working here? <laughs> and, grumbling that her remaining minions were not bringing home enough to eat. So the progress of my trap was a good happy feeling, you know, a bountiful hunt. All good, until one morning I really look at the trap, what's happening inside. The ants have found it. They had swirled up the chain link fence like a living river that's poured in through the vent holes. And pity the wasps that have gotten in there. I happened to arrive at the moment one could no longer fly and has flopped on its back on the floor, overrun by ants. It's, it's thrashing and it's pawing and it's, it's biting at necks, at, at ants gnawing at its neck while ants stand on its wings and, and savage the shoulder joints to chew off those wings at the roots. These ants are butchering the wasps alive into transportable pieces. The heads are meaty trophies to feed the grubs. The, the agony is, is real. The screams are just too high to hear. <laughs> Taking in the suffer house I've staged, I feel, I feel shame. I've killed things, you know, squashed the spiders and shot the rattlesnakes that were in the wrong place at the wrong time but always it had been as painless as I could imagine. Always I tried to kill right. But this situation with the wasp trap and the ants was different. It was a sick machine for needless 
suffering. I picture filling a black five-gallon pail at the spigot and, and sinking the whole show below the waterline so everyone can drown and be done with it. Then it hits me. I've put myself in a most biblical, moral position. Here I am with the life and death power of an Old Testament God in my literal garden, and there it is creation, this inadvertent, snarling mess of pain. What to do? Slink away? Drown the world? I'm leaning toward the slink away option. <laughs> <laughs> When a, a thought pops into my head, you know, a vision, I remember a story told by a friend. She grew up in East Germany on the hard side of the Iron Curtain. She said in 1945, the Allied soldiers marched her parents' town up the hill to Buchenwald to force them to look at the concentration camp horror they had ignored for years. This vision feels clear enough. Don't ignore the horror. So I get the bucket that will drown the world. I will end the suffering. But two steps from the water spigot, another thought stops me. That girlfriend's story had continued with how the allied Russians had put her own grandfather, a doctor, into that very same Buchenwald, simply for being a German infantryman not yet conveniently dead in the snows of Leningrad. And in that now Russian concentration camp, he died so that all she ever knew of this granddad was an empty army coat of heavy gray wool. This recollection of a grandfather snatched away changed things again. How Righteous rule makers may soon make their own victims, and the air grew heavy with my indecision. Would this drowning make me a righteous rule maker? Was I a man who judges killing and then kills in the thrall of judgment? So perhaps no drowning. Perhaps I must take down these traps altogether. But then, I remembered those tropical wasps that sting a spider and inject eggs inside it. So the larvae eat it, wiggling and alive from the inside out, just like aliens, but real and every day. <laughs> These wasps are not an entirely innocent sort of creature, I thought. They're not like me. They kill spiders wrong. <laughs> and my mind was in a whirl, for in not much knowledge is much vexation. Still, I thought, they can't help it. I should stop the suffering. And my hand crept toward the spigot handle. But then, midair, it stopped for good. As I remembered the time, my kids came screaming in through the back door, <laughs> scrabbling at wasps, stinging them from inside their shirts, inside their pants, inside the tangles of their hair. They had. They had found a deer skull in the trees behind our house, picked it up, and discovered it was the cap of a wasp's nest. Each wasp kept stinging my son and daughter until it was found and, and smashed. They had 50-odd <laughs> golf ball-sized stings each, and the, the tears. So then it felt clear. Suffer. <laughs> Suffer, you fuckers. My kids are coming. I left the bucket and walked inside, no slinking. The next day, the inside of the trap was cleaner than a dog-licked dinner plate. This choice, this easy vengeance, it troubles me. Because it marks the moment I started seeing the world as broken. Broken as a first principle and rigged from step one. The ants have babies to feed. The wasps do too. Sometimes David wins and a tiny ant takes home a meaty wasp head. Usually Goliath wins and a man tips dead wasps into a bin. But 
during this self-interested eating, someone is always taking too much, so much it grinds the others down to nothing. On the news that day, I see a Ukrainian POW who's been ground down to a skeleton. He staggers out of a Russian concentration camp in 2022, but he could have staggered out of Buchenwald in 1945. For what? So the latest narcissist who would be Caesar can eat another village. And in that moment, this POW suffering seemed faded, unsurprising and the natural product of a universe operating from a broken first principle. It's not a nice story, me leaving wasps to suffer, deciding pain is just what the universe does because some wasps had stung my kids. Part of me no longer cares. <laughs> but I can't stop seeing it, how the world is broken, how it's, it's baked into our DNA the self-interest, the tribalism, the rage. My friend had a border collie that hated the mailman so much it would bark and thrash and throw itself at the door. Although he fed it vegan dog food that's cruelty free. <laughs> still, still it chewed the mail slot with a fury and every day it bit away pieces of wood in a few months, he would surely make the hole big enough to get his head out. I don't know if he got that far. I do know that the dog's owner was an Episcopal priest, so the dog did not lack for moral guidance. <laughs> that dog showed me our morality is a thin veneer, and words will not keep our instincts in check. I know the world is broken because I've seen two hummingbirds radiant as sapphire dragonflies, stab and swoop and fight for hours over one scraggly tree and a patch of weeds no bigger than a driveway. For what? For the downy warm fluff of a lady hummingbird and two plain eggs no bigger than my pinky nail. These birds, they showed me that when there is not enough, then we are built to fight to get the babies just that little bit more. I see the world is broken in that choice of mine with the wasps. I see how everyone has something to protect from the mailman, how we all fight for one scraggly tree, how some take just as much as they can until you make them stop, how everyone has something they love Hummingbirds, ants, me, wasps too, I suppose. I say part of me no longer cares, but also I feel a dread, a hole in the chest. My kids are in this broken world. I can read a climate change map. I can see the places where the food grows now but won't when the rain won't fall. Drought makes hunger, hunger makes fighting, and fighting makes the hollow-eyed people. I want the hollow-eyed people to only be back then in 1945, only over there in Ukraine. But I fear bad times coming for my grandchildren. I feel the edge of it now. I fear in 50 years for them, it will be Dust Bowl bad, bread line bad, gray wool jacket bad. These cries coming from our future are like the cries coming from our past, just too far away to hear. Anyway, me with my bucket and my wasps. I couldn't keep thinking about it. I just wanted to hug my kids while my part of the world is still working, not ground to bits. Besides, there was much to do and little time, what with Vesuvius trembling, night falling, and me hoping my Vulcanalia might be one joyful light 
brought forward to appease a growing darkness. Like a Roman, I wanted to call out to the world, on the brink, hey, look, life is so sweet. Please, not again. Please, let us be okay. Band first timer, James Biggs.